Okay, Patrick, so we'll start from like 10 to 11. So, Lord is on you. You can yeah. start. Can everyone hear me? Uh, Patrick, your voice is a bit muffled. So, I don't know. It's not really. We are hearing, but it is a muffled one. Okay. Uh, let me just lower the speaker volume. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we are hearing. Okay. Is that muffled or better? Uh, this is still muffled, Patrick. I think you are in looks you talk like alien here <laughs> somewhere else. Right, I'm gonna bring the speaker closer to me. Is this better, guys? No, same as alien, Patrick. Can mm. you change? I think you need to change something. I need to change something, huh? Yeah, can you use your head? Headphone. Right, is this better? Okay, I think you can start, Patrick. We can hear. Okay. Right. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, and meet, um, to Sunda, who is chairing this session. My topic is on tonsillitis, quincy, and glandular fever. These themes are mainly ENT, and according to the new curriculum. Patrick, we can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. Is it a, what device are you using? Is it a laptop or? I'm actually in the, in the, the room is it? cabin. Huh? In the registrar's room. It is portacaba, it's like. Yeah. Uh, if you could use a room. headphone or something, that would be better. Right. Can everyone hear me now? It's the hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, yeah, yeah, a bit better, yeah. Okay, all right, I'll speak closer to the computer. So my topic is on tonsillitis, quincy, and glandular fever. Now, Patrick, are you showing the slide or? Can you see my slides? No, we cannot. So. Uh, can you share the screen? Can you see the screen? No, we cannot. Right. You have to press that tab. Click on the share screen, then press on the tab, then again press on the zoom. I think that's how that's how it will come up. Yeah. Right, okay, fine. Let me just... uh, right, share screen is not, that button is not showing here. So when you click share screen in the bottom. Yeah, when you click share screen, the zoom will uh, get right, smaller. So I, right, I've got I click on the share I've screen, the... then click a tab button. Right, okay, share screen. And then click on the Zoom. So I think it will kick start. Am I right, Sundar? Yeah, so click on the. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Can you see now? Oh, yeah, well done. Yeah, we could see now. Okay, fine. Starting from the beginning. Right, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. we can see now. Yeah, okay. we can see oh, a can you see fever. Me? Okay. Can you move the slide, Patrick? Sometime it will. Yeah. Is it not? Yeah. 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 You're right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Slide. Excellent. Can everyone hear me now? I'm so glad that I'm a me. specialist now. I'm IT specialist now. <laughs> okay. All right. So the topics on tonsillitis, quincy, and glandular fever. Now, in these three topics, the Acronyms or abbreviations I've used are uh, ELISA, which, mean, which stands for enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, CMVs for cytomegalovirus, 
NICE is for National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and TB is for tuberculosis, and HIV is for human immunodeficient virus. Now, translitis versus pharyngitis. Now, these are terms that are used in ENT interchangeably. Translitis is difficult to distinguish from viral pharyngitis. Now, viruses in the form of adenoviruses, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes, and herpes cause 90% of all sore throats. Translitis refers to the infection of the palatine parenchyma, and translitis can occur alone or as part of a generalized pharyngitis. Clinical distinction between translitis and pharyngitis is unclear and is often referred to as acute sore throat. And beta hemolytic streptococcus is responsible for 5 to 15% of sore throat in adults. And in children, 15 to 30% of sore throats are due to beta hemolytic streptococcus. Now, the, the role of tonsils is to filter bacteria and viruses. And the tonsils that we normally refer to as tonsils are palatine tonsils, which are situated in the lateral wall of the oropharynx, between the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal muscles. The tonsils themselves are made of lymphoid tissue, which is part of the world there's ring, along with adenoids, tubal and lingual tonsils, and they make, they make B lymphocytes, and the B lymphocytes are situated in what we call germinal centers where bacteria and viruses are ingested. Embryologically, tonsils are derived from the endoderm and the second pharyngeal pouch, and they are innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now, in histology, we, we tend to be told what Waldeus ring is all about. So it's a circle of protective lymphoid tissue in the oropharynx. Now in the roof of that, um, of the oropharynx, we have got adenoids. Now adenoids are very important in childhood up to the age of eight when they start regressing. So they, so they don't become as prominent as they, as we find them in children. Uh, when it comes to people in adulthood, adenoids are less of importance compared to tonsils. Now on the wall, there's ring, you can see you've got the adenoids, and then you've got tubal tonsils, then you've got palatine tonsils, and then you've got lingual tonsils. Now this, you should just keep it in mind because I will explain to you where these tonsils are situated. Now, we said tonsillitis is caused by viruses. Now it's about 85% of that. And all the viruses that cause tonsillitis are classified as follows. You've got rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, and herpes, and epstein bar virus, and HIV, as well as cytomegalovirus. The bacterial um, causes are beta hemolytic streptococcus, strep pneumonia, and hemophilus influenza, as well as TB and diphtheria and syphilis and chlamydia. 15 to 30% of the UK population attend primary care with translitis every year. Now, this diagram just shows you at the back of the mouth in the oropharynx where the tonsils are situated. And I've explained these tonsils in my previous uh, slide. We have got adenoids, we've got tubal tonsils, we've got palatal tonsils, and lingual tonsils. Now, one of the most important things you should be able to do is when you are looking at a patient coming with tonsillitis, is to be able to see whether they've got big tonsils or small tonsils. 
for that's very important when you're making a distinction as to whether the the tonsils are just enlarged because it's a normal size or there is increased size of the tonsils because of infection or swelling. So we've got grade one tonsils, which you can probably hardly see in the corners of the oral pharynx. And then the grade two tonsils actually become bigger, grade three tonsils much bigger, and the grade four tonsils are quite enlarged. Now, what this implies is if someone has got tonsillitis, if they've got grade four tonsils, they can really become very unwell with it, even if the infection is not that severe. Now, the lymph nodes that drain the tonsils are situated in, a, in the anterior and posterior triangles of the neck. But the ones that I would like you to remember when you're doing uh, lymph node examination of someone coming with tonsillitis is the jugulodigastric lymph nodes. Now, the jugulodigastric lymph nodes are situated behind the angle of the mandible. So if you are doing your examination of the neck lymph nodes, they are the ones that you can feel just below the angle of the mandible. If someone has got severe tonsillitis, those lymph nodes will be swollen and tender. Blood supply of the tonsils is derived from the facial arteries and its branches. Right, and we also know that the innervation of the tonsils is derived from the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is a mixed sensory and motor nerve. Venous drainage of the tonsils we say if the arterial supply of the tonsils is from the facial artery and its branches, the venous drainage is from into the facial vein. So bear that in mind. Now we said the glossopharyngeal nerve uh, is the cranial nerve that innervates the tonsils or supplies the tonsils. Now I've just made an illustration of the trajectory that is followed by the cranial nerve of this glossopharyngeal nerve as it comes out of the uh, jugular foramen to go and supply the tonsils. Uh, symptoms of tonsillitis, you've got dysphagia, which is difficulties in swallowing, and then odinophagia, which is pain on swallowing, Otalgia is where the pain is referred to the ear. And then you, you also have malaise, fever, and swollen tender lymph nodes. You might also see white exudate and drooling, which is quite of saliva, it's quite common in children who have got tonsillitis. They will also present with a stiff neck and they might have halitosis and headache. So these are the clinical features of a patient presenting with tonsillitis. Severe tonsillitis can actually present as in these two slides. On the left side, the tonsils are grade four tonsils, but they are inflamed. There's erythema around them. And you can see a lot of secretion in this kind of situation, the patient will be struggling to swallow food. They might be finding it difficult to, to handle their own saliva. On the right-hand side, tonsils have got a white exudate. The uvula is, in, is central, but this is also a serious situation because this patient will be aching, they will be uncomfortable, with swallowing and there'll be in a lot of pain. So management of tonsillitis, you take a history, how long the symptoms, any cough, any smoking history, sexual history, weight loss, previous treatment. On an examination of the oropharynx, you are going to see either white exudate erythema around the tonsils. You also have got to do an examination of the lymph nodes in the anterior triangle and posterior triangle of the neck. 
and also along the ones that run along the medial edge of stenoclade or mastoid muscle. You also have got to do a chest examination. Now, you will also order blood tests, such as full blood count to check for lymphocytosis, liver function test to see if they are deranged, use and ease to see if there's any AKI, and then you've got a monospot test, and there's another test called poor banal test. Now, the monospot test and poor banal test are tests that check for the immunoglobulin. IgM, which is produced within three weeks of an infection. Then you've got ELISA, which is immunosorbent um, linked assay, which tests for IgG or antibodies of the um, of the either the virus or the bacteria. Then you also can do an HIV test. Because Patrick, can I also, ask a question? Sorry to interrupt. I, what's the difference between monospot and power bunnel test? Right. So um, thanks for asking that. So monospot test actually tends to use sheep red cells to agglutinate or, or to precipitate the antigen of the virus you are looking for. So the virus we are looking for is Epstein Barr virus, which is a herpes virus. Uh, the poor banal test uses uh, horse blood to precipitate the antigens of the um, Epstein Barr virus. And we so, monospot test is microscopy of the red blood cells, am I right? Yeah, that's it, yeah. And the poor banal test is a serological test, tested anti, what they call antibodies against the antigen. Right, so essentially, uh, monospot and uh, poor banal tests are ch checking for IgM, right? IgM, which is produced within three weeks. Whereas IgG is the longer uh, acting antibody, IgM is kind of transient. It comes during the acute phase of an infection. The, the, the two tests were developed by two developers, but they were just looking at was Sera versus sheep Sera in order to do the precipitation test. Uh, is that clear? Yeah, so, yeah, you're right. Uh, mm. Right. And but they're the both line, used for the, they're both used for the, um, uh, what they call it, uh, infectious uh, mononucleosis. Yeah. So infectious mononucleosis is glandular fever. And I, I shall come to glandular fever at some stage. So the glandular fever is, is um, called infectious mononucleosis. And in loose terms, it's also called, it's also called the kissing disease because it's found in people teenagers, people aged between 15 and 25, who tend to get this disease through, uh, I mean, glandular fever through kissing, epstein Barr virus. Right. So the treatment for translitis is, if it is mild to moderate translitis, we use oral antibiotics and discharge the patient. That is what we do in AME. Or in, or in GP surgery. Severe translitis, we normally refer to ENT. But in ANE, please, just like we've been discussing the proper management of patients, try to give soothing medication, IV antibiotics, IV analgesia, and fluid, and also dexamethasone makes a huge difference to patients' condition whilst they are waiting, you know, their long road to get into onto the ENT ward. They will feel a lot better if we give them the regimen that I've written here. IV Benpen, IV paracetamol, IV fluid, and IV dexamethasone. Right. Now, there is also, when we're discussing translitis, um, 
an entity called streptococcal sore throat. And streptococcal sore throat is caused by streptococcus pyogen, pyogenes infection. And it's an infection that where you feel there's severe sore throat, but you feel like you can scratch the back of your throat. That's the irritation you'll be having. And it accounts for a small proportion of sore throat. If untreated streptococcal sore throat, it can lead to rheumatic disease and kidney inflammation. Rheumatic disease can lead to joint pains and the heart valve damage, Ashcroft antibodies, all these um, the stuff that we learned when we were doing a, a pathology is now coming back in. Strep sore throat is common in children, but also in all age groups. Risk factors are, you know, young age, like in children and the winter season. The clinical features of uh, strep cocoa sore throat are dysphagia or dysphagia, fever, rash, white exudate, uh, red spot at the back of the soft palate, um, headache, swollen tender lymph nodes in the neck. The inflammatory reactions caused by streptococcal sore throat, like I said, are scarlet fever, which is a strep infection characterized by a prominent rash. Uh, and then glomerular nephritis and rheumatic fever, like I've said, and also post strep reactive arthritis. So be watch out for these features when you are reviewing patients with acute translitis. Now, recurrent translitis, this is a very important entity here because I'll, I'll explain to you why. Is when you've got more than five episodes or more of translitis in the last 12, 12 months. Or it could be four episodes per year in the last two years. Then three episodes per year in the last three years. So recurrent episodes of translitis require to be those patients who are presenting with recurrent translitis need to be listed for translectomy through their GP as funding comes from the primary care. So we might not be able to see people, but when you're inquiring in your history, you should be able to say whether this patient is coming in with recurrent translitis because then you can advise them appropriately that if they need to consider translectomy, you know, they've got to write, if the GP was going to do the initial uh, application for funding or translectomy. Now, let's come to glandular fever. Now, glandular fever, you might not be able to see it because it accounts for 1% of all the cases of translitis in primary and secondary care. The causes, like I said, Epstein Barr virus causes 90%. Uh, and Epsom bar virus is a ubiquitous herpes viride virus found in 15 to 25 year old uh, age group. Then you also have got cytomegalovirus, adenoviruses, herpes 6 virus, toxoplasmosis, and HIV. All these cause can contribute to glandular fever. Now, the classic, classic trial for glandular fever is cervical lymphadenopathy laryngitis and fever. Now the blood that you request to rule out glandular fever are full blood count. Now in full blood count, you are looking for in, uh, lymphocytosis and also LFTs, they will be deranged and CRP will be, will be either high or normal. And then you do the monospot test and four binary test. Now the ELISA, which is immunoglobin linked assay, you will be looking for the capsid and nuclear antigens of Epstein Barr virus. Now to manage glandular fever, the patient needs to be admitted just for rest, analgesia, hydration, plus or minus, well, dexamethasone has got to be given anyway. A recent Cochrane review supports steroid use as this improves pain and resolution. I remember when I was on an ENT ward with a, a, a patient who came with glandular fever. He stayed there for about five days and the neck lymph nodes were very 
swollen and congested. So it was just getting him to get better. It was just a nightmare. We kept him for five days. So it can be quite a difficult disease to deal with. Now, when you discharge a patient with glandular fever, you've got to tell them what the follow-up plans are. And the follow-up plans are based on the possible complications of glandular fever. The glandular fever can cause clinic rupture, and it can also cause chronic fatigue syndrome. So what to tell the patient is avoid contact sport for four to eight weeks or even longer. And the contact sport that uh, we talk about is gym weight lifting, because that increases intra-abdominal pressure. And this can actually, um, well, that's what, I mean, the spleen can get involved in when there's an increase of intra-abdominal pressure. Avoid rugby, football, hockey, and gymnastics. Now, the follow-up with the GP is to repeat LFTs in six weeks' time. Now, in America, they do ultrasound of the abdomen, if necessary, to rule out splenomegaly as a way of following up this patient. The diagnostic tests for glandular fever and bacterial translitis. I just want to get a comparison here based on sensitivity and specificity. In glandular fever, we look for lymphocytosis and sensitivity of lymphocytosis is about 84%, specifically 72%. The monospot assays for glandular fever have got a sensitivity of 71% to 99%, and a specificity 91 to 98%. And the antibody, which is ELISA, has got 97% sensitivity. Uh, and that is probably now the mainstay of trying to diagnose glandular fever, is an ELISA test. But it takes longer for you to get the result for it. Bacterial translitis, we still use throat swabs with a sensitivity of 74%. We also use a rapid streptococcal antigen sensitive test, which has got a sensitivity of 84%. Now we look at um, Quincy abscess. Now, Quincy abscess is a complication of severe translitis. Now, I just want you to see what happened to a 26 year old female that came to our ward when I was doing ENT. She had had five days of sore throat, which was characterized by odinophagia, dysphagia, fever. She'd gone to the GP out of hours and antibiotics were prescribed. Despite this, sore throat worsened in the next two days. And on arrival, she had trismus. Now, trismus is where the jaw actually goes into a lock, you know, the uh, pterygoids cannot open the jaws. There's drooling of saliva and there's odinophagia. And there could be an airway problem here because that is what happens in uh, a queen's abscess because of the mass effect of the abscess. Blood showed mildly raised neutral fluid white cell count in the CRT of 54. Now, this lady was taken onto the ENT ward and we did, uh, I did drain the, uh, the queen's abscess and sent the, the pus which showed streptococcus albinosa, which was sensitive to clean the mycin. So we continue to manage on dexamethasone, then 10 paracetamol and metronidazole. Now metronidazole is included if you've got a Quincy abscess, in addition to Benfen, because it actually acts on the mixed flora that you find in some of these um, uh, discharges or the pus. And you also have got to think about Diflam spray. It, it also helps. Diflam spray is like a local anesthetic. Uh, the Diflam is actually the um, what is the generic name for it is uh, benzamide. So the spray. Now, when this patient came, we we, we drained the Quincy on the 
first gen. And she continued on ARGs and, and, and antibiotics. On the second day, that swelling continued and we drained the quinzy again, 10 mils of it. Uh, five to 10 mils, so it was drained using a 10 mil syringe. On the third day, swelling had not resolved. The consultant uh, ENT surgeon decided to do a CT scan of the neck and it showed a 30 millimeter by 40 millimeter pass collection, which was effacing the, the oropharynx. So you can see that there was also an airway issue that you had to consider here. The patient was listed for emergency theater for drainage of the quinze under general anesthesia. And she was kept on the ward and discharged on J5 on oral antibiotics. So a quinze can be stubborn to it, guys. But when you see it in A&E, do the right thing. Steroids, antibiotics, analgesia, and you refer to ENT. So this is how the, um, the CT scan of the print looked with the effacement of the mass towards the, the oropharynx and narrowing of the oropharynx. So we said that QMT is also called a peritoneal abscess. The treatment for this is draining. Now I've put stars between one and one, two, and three. Your needle actually goes to point number two. And what you do is you go in there, you, have, you spray that with lidocaine, all the patients open their mouth, and then you go in with your green needle and you try to suck as much pus, even if you, pass, if you suck just air, because otherwise might, the patient might get some relief out of it. But this cannot be done in our a &E because we don't have the, you know, the skill, we just refer this to ENT. And once you've um, aspirated, we call it aspiration. Uh, sometimes you can use a scalpel as well to release that pus. Now, the pitfalls of uh, dealing with tonsillitis are multifactorial. Now, in children, now I'll give this an, a, as an example. It was ENT coverage for Doncaster is the basis in Doncaster. But we, if, if you're covering ENT, you see patients in Rodram and probably Basel floor and you refer them to Doncaster. Now in Rotherham, we have got, uh, you can actually negotiate with kids and admit children there. Now there was a case of a child we, we were treating for translitis. And it appeared that this child did, was responding to all um, IV antibiotics. And we were told to know like, uh, the child had been on the ward from Monday to Friday. Around Friday, the child had been there for five days. We, we found that no, the child had just spiked the temperature at night. During the morning, it appeared when they are doing the world round as if the child was really picking up. But then there was something that, saw, that just didn't add up. The CRP didn't go down. And one of the on-call consultants said, well, let's do a CT scan of this child. And it turned out that the child is a retropharyngeal abscess. So these infect, throat infections, upper respiratory tract infections can actually result in collection that can actually cause, you know, complicate the whole picture. So be mindful about patients we are seeing in a &E where the GP has not really been there welcome person they are now coming to AME, they need help just try to see if they can be reviewed by ENT if you are in doubt or your senior the other conundrum that you see in translitis is in those people who are over 40 years of age and they smoke or they have a long-standing smoking history they come to any, you look at their oropharynx, 
you find they've got just one swollen tonsil on one side. Be suspicious of that patient. Don't give them oral antibiotics and send them home because that patient could be having a lymphoma. And lymphomas are common. I mean, tonsil lymphomas are common in patients who are above 40 and they are smokers. So linking up with ENT with that history and examination might be probably what will help the patient eventually because help will be so near and then, but you are, you are doubting that no, it's not severe tonsillitis. This patient can go home and you turn away someone who could be, you know, uh, appropriate for a two week referral or a biopsy investigation. So, um, tonsillitis appears like a simple topic, but it can come with all these horrible diagnoses or complications. Um, that's the end of my presentation, guys. Hello. Hi. So, if anyone has like questions, so we can discuss. Yes. Okay. If, if, if said, I didn't hear your question, if, if anyone has got what? Uh, uh, thank you, Patrick, for like this session. So if anybody has a question, we can discuss. Otherwise, we will move to another session. Yes, or... uh, uh, Patrick, clinically, I <clears throat> paratonsillar obsession uh... Quincy. Quincy. Yeah. Sometimes difficult to differentiate, but I would guess there's no, you know, I mean, it doesn't need differentiation because the treatment, they both need treatment, they both need admission. Yeah. So is any any significance uh, of, uh, you know, difference, uh, significance of difference between these two conditions? Or paratonsillar uh, abscess and Quincy. Is that is that what you're asking? Is that um, no, no. Is that I mean, what's the clinical like? what's the clinical significance uh, between the retropharyngeal or Quincy and the paratonsillar abscess? Right. Okay. Fine. So, what what if you have got if you have got um um if you've got a Quincy or paratonsillar abscess? It can um, actually, the infection can actually spread into the retropharyngeal space. And that's, that's quite common in children who are less than three years. That, that extension is quite common at that age. In adults, it's, it's rare uh, because that space will have kind of narrowed. It's very rare for it to spread that way rather than spread in the, it actually spread in a parallel fashion where it encroaches onto the uh, op opening of the oropharynx, narrowing it, which is the reason why if someone has got a Quincy, they can really shut their oropharynx so quickly. They will really be struggling. They will not be able to handle their own saliva. The piriform force is completely uh, out of reach because the saliva is not going anywhere. Right. On this note, I just want to share this, this uh, quick anatomy of the retropharyngeal space just to have a good highlight about what we are looking at, what we should be a bit worried about. So I'm just going to share the slide if it's okay. Just That's quick one. You mean, you mean the slide? Yeah, so this is the slide I was talking about. Basically, uh, it's one of the pictures that we need to be a bit aware of. As you can see, this whole area, retropharyngeal space is just around this. This whole space is retropharyngeal space. Yeah, it's behind the, behind the pharynx. It's quite contiguous with the carotid sheath, as you can see. And it's quite contiguous with the esophagus. So basically, usually the uh, mediastinitis can happen 
because of trickling in into this esophageal, uh, you know, the back of the esophageal kind of um, fascia. And also, yeah. uh, if you think about it, it's it runs along like height wise. It runs along from the uh, top of the pharyngeal uh, constrictor muscles towards uh, up to the level of the larynx. It's yeah. quite a dead space that we're looking for. And mainly these areas, they've got like a, a retropharyngeal uh, lymph node. That is the site where it actually uh, gets infected, oh. inflamed, and that is what actually necrosis happens mm -hmm. and the infection can spread and it becomes more of a bilateral infection from the unilateral. Uh, so so this is the area that needs to be involved and also the cervical vertebra, which is just over here. So there can be a lot of, uh, you know, difficulty, more of a uh, kind of rigid neck or like a difficulty in moving your neck as well. Sometimes it's, yeah. it's mainly, it's mainly because of that uh, whole area being more swollen and filled with the, uh, abscess and filled with extra fluids so that yeah. is what need to be more worried about it's more to do with like whether the um ct neck is required uh, from any point of view is what we need to think about and also alerting the ent is a is a high important because this can actually uh, debilitate the patient for a long time so this is this is the main area we need to make sure that we we know the anatomy and then whether when when we are looking at we never see the space as such there is not supposed to be a significant space but because of the infection the space gets enlarged and actually pushes onto carotid yeah. sheath esophageal yeah. area and then it kind of kind of uh, passes onto those planes so that is what uh, I just wanted to highlight so, when yeah, yeah. you're presenting. So, Suraj, so in other words, it can extend right up to the metastinum mm -hmm. uh, because there's the, the dead space and uh, there's no uh, limitation there. So, yeah. the retro finger abscess, yeah, you're right, it can be quite serious and deadly. Uh, Paratons abscess uh, is localized sort of thing, but the retro finger abscess is a bit nasty. Yeah, you can see there's a dead space going right to the metastinum and right down. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to show you that picture right there. Oh, there. Sorry. I think I went up. Just there. As you can see this yeah, retrofangal yeah, space right, right yeah. here. Mm. This one. It's see mm -hmm. from the base of the clivus all the way down this is actually going into the mediastinal aspect as well paratracheal mm. so these are the yeah. ones which we don't see this is what we need to be more worried about and if it involves like a decreased neck extension uh, or uh, you know painful neck flexion extension uh, that is the time we need to think about like okay worst thing can happen maybe we need a ct scan maybe we need to alert this ent right away most of the time the Paratonsular abscess or Quincy would be drained by the NTSHO by just doing a local spray at the parallel yeah. to this uvula area. And, um, and number two that you mentioned, um, and just they, they put a like green um, cannula or the syringe and they, they suck it out. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, what we should be worried about is this space being more like increase in size and actually infection being contained inside. So that's more of an emergency. I'd like to unsay my- Yeah, fair. I think, I think the CT scan, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, our job is to refer to ENT, start with proper treatment, and then the CT scan will leave to the ENT, is it? Because they can request, but uh, I agree with you, if they suspect retrofinial uh, abscess, so CT should be done. To know the extent and you know the the severity of the collection. Mm -hmm. So who is the next one? Could we have a bit of break now? Yeah, I think yeah. Well done, Patrick. Excellent. Thought provoking. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But your your quota cable system is is no good because it's, 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 I think it's quite muffled. Is it quite muffled, eh? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. When I was on nights, I said, let me just go to the photocabinet. Oh, you were doing nights? God. Yeah, 
You you are a you are a Superman, honestly. <laughs> I mean, Spiderman. Tom Costa, nice. Sundar, maybe a break, or you would like to continue? So we can have like five minute break. We'll start. I think that should be enough. We could, yeah. you know, so move out. Eleven five. I'd like to say, uh, Suraj, thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you are feeling better now. I hope you're not better. 